Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see all of y'all. Welcome to First Unitarian. Uh, welcome especially to our visitors if this is your first time or if you're fairly new to our community. We're especially glad to have you. I invite you to stay after service, have some coffee with us. Even our online folks, we have an online coffee hour for you as well. We'd love to get to know you and introduce ourselves to you. I have a few announcements as we begin. First, I want you to think back to the very first time that you entered a UU congregation and the person who met you at the door. Maybe it was today. You don't have to remember back very far. But for most of us, it's been a while. That first person that greeted you at the door was the, sort of an ambassador of Unitarian Universalism to you. Something about it made you stay. We're looking for people like you to be people like those people, to be greeters for our congregation. It's such an important part of our ministry to this community, and we need some more greeters. So if you've ever wanted to be a greeter, but wondered if it might be difficult or complicated, if you've ever served as a greeter before and you'd like to rejoin the team, we're going to have a training this Saturday, 10 o'clock, right here at, at uh, I'm not sure which room it's going to be in, but here. Uh, we're also looking for new volunteers to help make and serve coffee on Sunday mornings. We're heading towards summer and folks will be traveling, so we can't do without coffee, right? It's practically a sacrament here. And it's also a great way to meet people and have fun doing something easy to serve your community. So if that seems like something that you would like to do, I invite you to talk to one of our coffee volunteers this morning and find out how to join the team. There are so many things to do here at our church. Uh, we have a monthly music jam. We have a monthly drum circle. It's happening tomorrow night. Drums tomorrow night. Uh, we have mystical spirituality. We have a social justice movie that's coming up on the 15th of this month, April. And there's lots more. So I encourage you to check out our Torch newsletter. You get it in your email. And if you're not getting it in your email, you can sign up on our website, slcuu.org. Our lay minister this morning is Nancy Mose. It was so good at 9 o'clock, y'all. I can't wait for y'all to hear it. It's really good. And finally, I just want to have a moment of celebration. Uh, every year, we set a goal for our pledge campaign. And then we have the pledge campaign, we have the budget, and they're kind of doing this thing, getting a little closer and a little closer. But it's been a long time since we set the goal and we reached it. And this year, we reached it. Right? We reached it. That is so amazing. If you go out and you look at Becky's little thermometer stuff, it's at the top. It's at 150 degrees or whatever. <laughs> it's at 500 degrees. It's all the way up. Now, we also have inflation, right? So cola raises. So we still do have a little bit more money to raise to get to our budget. But I just think it's really important that this congregation set a goal and reached it. And that we can't let that get by us, right? That's so awesome. Good, to, good on you. 199 pledges. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Now, on that tide of good vibes, we settle down into the work of worship, the work of making community and being together, what we're here for today. Our chalice lighting this morning is by the legendary religious educator, Sophia Lyon Foz. Many of the past generation and many of today have found three abiding values in prayer. The quiet meditation on life, the reaching out toward the universal and the infinite, and the courageous facing of one's profoundest wishes. Let parents share and sense with their children the glory and mystery of everyday things. Let them look with sympathy upon humanity's age-long dilemmas. Let no questions 
be taboo. The next generation can ill afford to have the deeper values deleted from the book of life. Our opening hymn is the very first one in this book. It's a good thing it's up front because you're not going to have a lot of time to listen to the music before you jump in singing, okay? <laughs> As we learned at 9 o'clock. Please rise with me, number 10 0 1000, num first one. <laughs> yeah, first service got in trouble. <laughs> really fast. Those first measures, you count four fast. One, two, three, four. Two, two, three, four. Three, two, three, four. Four, two, three, four. One. Morning has come. All right, but it goes by in a hurry. You'll get it. No problems. You're fine. Do you ever feel like you've shared too much? A little TMI? <sighs> Sometimes it feels a bit odd how much you all know about me. <laughs> I've stood up here and told you about some of my deepest hurts and my sincerest hopes. I've heard that my stories have resonated with some of you and maybe entertained some of you, and maybe just a big meh for others. Regardless, I have to say from my end that you all have transformed me. When I began this lay ministry program, I had no idea what to expect. I have struggled through readings that were to me sometimes esoteric and sometimes a little new agey, and sometimes they just pushed my buttons. I've pondered, reflected, meditated, and tinkered with ideas that have had me looking deeply at who I am as a human being and in relationship with others. At times, I was frustrated and couldn't find the words. At others, it flowed out of me like it was just waiting to be released for years. But the consistent thing has been the love and support that I have felt from this community. Although I've been a member for more than 25 years, I never knew that I could feel such support on a personal and emotional level. 
It's been an awesome experience. It's opened me up to ways of being that I didn't know that I had access to. My religious background scarred me. I can see that now. I know that the messages I was given as a young person, and even up until the funerals of my parents, was like a sour gummy. It was tart when I wanted sweet. It often left me feeling guilt and ashamed of my desires to be more than what a woman was supposed to be. It left me confused about God. I can clearly remember thinking that the first commandment made no sense. I am the true God, the Lord God, thou shalt not have no gods before me. So if you're the true God, why are you concerned about other gods? <laughs> and why are you so jealous? You're omnipotent, okay? It rankled me. But the curious thing is, since I've started speaking about it, its hold on me has lessened. I can still get awfully riled up by the supposedly Christian things that our legislature and many around the country are doing in the name of faith. But I am taking back that word for myself, faith. Faith is my search for truth. It has empowered me. I can have a faith that has nothing to do with a jealous God, but everything to do with living a life full of faith in my values and beliefs. I believe in love. This is central to my being. I was so lucky to have learned to love from my wonderful family. My parents' love was never in doubt, and my sisters remain a sense of solace when I'm hurting, and my biggest cheerleaders when I experience a victory. This foundational love is something I'm grateful for every day. It gives me faith that love is real and actionable. I believe in friendship. I believe in meaningful relationships. My closest friends and I have had our ups and downs, some tricky spots, but we've been committed to our relationship and we've pushed through. My husband has been a constant in my life since we met at 16. We have grown up together and grown together and apart many times over the years. Our love and friendship has kept me on my path. I believe in generosity. My own experience tells me that the more I commit myself to serving, the more dedicated I become. Becoming a lay minister has deepened my connection with this church, giving of myself, of my time, my money, and my skills. That makes me belong here. I believe in community. I believe in this community. I have to admit that I wasn't sure what would happen after Reverend Tom Goldsmith left our church. I was worried that between that and the pandemic, which forced us to be apart from each other, that we wouldn't survive and be the same. And you know what? We didn't. We're not the same. We are transforming. I believe that we're becoming something new a place where the language of emotion is more welcome and where we can truly embody the word community. I can feel this change in myself. I'm opening myself up to different possibilities. I don't have to accept others' definitions of faith and community. I can work toward a vision of wholeness. I have a role to play in this church, in this community, as do all of you. I'm excited, excited for the next chapter of our church. We have so much to do in this world. We have so many things to transform. And I have faith in us. This morning is one of my favorite worship services of the year. It is our child dedication service. If I could invite the children and families that are being dedicated today to come on up, please.
friends and family, beloved community, we have been brought together by these children for this joyous occasion to recognize them into this congregation and our circle of love. Every day that a child is born is a miracle, an opportunity to recognize the power of love, a day to give thanks for the beauty of this earth, a day to recognize the sacred calling of a community, that the sacred calling of a community is to guide and nurture their children together. Welcome to the circle of love. As we love and work to dedicate ourselves and each other to the care and tending of our children. We recognize all that are gathered here now and those who are away from us in distance and time. We honor the ancestors who have left this world, but not our hearts and we welcome them here in our minds. We begin with a poem from the poet Hafiz. What is the root of all these words? One thing, love. But a love so deep and sweet, it needed to express itself with scents, sounds, colors that never existed before. Who do you bring to this gathered community today? Elton and Ada, Joey, Sebastian, <laughs> Elta and Aiden, Ada, oh it's, Aiden is a good friend of mine, it's the <laughs> thing that happens, Ada, uh, Joey and Sebastian, we welcome you all into our community. We give thanks for your life and for all of the hope that you bring. You are unique. There is no one else like you in the entire world. Your parents and your family welcome you in all of your uniqueness. Exactly. <laughs> Especially sneezes onto daddy's neck. <laughs> we give you this rose, a symbol of our love, Look at that. Help me out. Pass it to Joey. Oh, we'll give this one to Joey. And there you go, Sebastian. We also recognize that like a rose, you will need to be nurtured and cared for as you grow. And we will be ready to be the place for you to find what you need to thrive and bloom. With its beauty, roses also have their thorns. We've kind of taken a bunch of them off here right now, <laughs> for safety's sake. Uh, GMO roses, guys. GMO, there you go. But, yeah, okay. which helps remind you, right, that life is beautiful, but it can be filled with some hardships. When these hardships present themselves, our community will be here to support and love you. Do you parents agree to love, support, and dedicate yourselves to do all that you can to share the beauty and goodness of life with your children? If you agree, please say, we do. We do. Do you, the children, so all my friends out here, the children, so, and youth, be loud and proud, friends, of the First Unitarian Church, agree to accept these children into our community, to support them, encourage them, and grow with them. Please say, we do. We do. Well, there's some children at heart. We have a lot of I know. <laughs> this is for the remaining adults. Okay, the other adults can do it too. Do you, the adult portion of the congregation, agree to delight in these children's accomplishments, share in their sorrows, and encourage them in any way and in every way as they grow into adulthood? Will you help raise these children to love justice and live with compassion? Will you extend kindness and courage? If so, if you agree, please say, we do. We do. Let us bless these children with the wonders of the earth. Let us as a community support these families as they continue to grow. In you, we find hope for a better world. In you, we share new life. We rejoice with your parents, 
families, and friends, and take upon ourselves the privilege and responsibility of helping to nurture you in character and spirit. We wish you all the joy and happiness in your life, so full of promise. It is a beautiful world, and you have made it more beautiful still. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Now, these are for Ada and Alton. This is for Joey. And this is for Sebastian. You got it. You need two more arms. The first service, we were kind of reflecting a little bit on the spell choir. And uh, I learned uh, that they are here every Tuesday and sometimes Saturday uh, to do what they do, which is really quite a huge commitment when you think about it. And why do they do it? Because we're cool. OK. <laughs> There's that. It is cool. I mean, what says, what's cooler than Bell Choir? <laughs> you know, they come and they, they come and spend time with David in the evening. They could, there's lots of things they could be doing on Tuesday night. And they come to give you a gift, which is really quite remarkable, right? There's, in this wor sort of commodified world where we, are all about exchange and like um, people, uh, what do I get if I do this? They come to give you something, a moment of beauty, uh, an, an encounter with, you know, this sound bath that is part of this story about how do we come and live together? How do we share a story about love? And this church, I mean, we sort of a little bit kind of take it for granted. And we, like, if we can focus on things. We're like, oh, my God, the ceiling is gone. <laughs> right? But actually, this appeared out of nowhere. It appeared out of the generosity of people who just said, we want a place to come and love one another. That's the only thing that caused this to exist. It's really quite remarkable. That's what you do. You come together to say, I want to be with other people just so I can have an opportunity to love them and to be loved. And in doing so, you, give, you come every Tuesday and sometimes Saturday to let them know and to do that. And you know, Colleen leads the meditation group. Now maybe she's after you know, some sort of supreme enlightenment. <laughs> she's almost there. Maybe she's there to hold space so other people can come and just find that thing for themselves, right? It's a gift. And there are very few places left, honestly, it feels that way, 
where you can come and you enjoy this intergenerational space uh, of people just giving to one another. It's, it really struck me this morning, and I just am so thankful to the Bell Choir for sort of awakening that in me. And this, the people on this side, too, I, I look, I've seen this too. <laughs> Now's the time for our offertory. Um, it's one of the gifts we give, right? To make this place, to bring it out of the ether um, so that we can love one another. Thank you so much. Your generosity is gratefully received. As many of you know, uh, I was raised in a small town in New Hampshire, uh, but so was my mom, uh, and so was her dad, and so were the nine generations before him. Yeah, we didn't go very far. <laughs> Uh, my family has been in that area for a long time, so a lot of the stories sort of revolve around uh, that geography. And my mom, she actually grew up on the same street as five of her cousins, so they would just all play on that street together. My dad's family was, you know, all the way down in Connecticut, which, you know, it's like Provo. Who, <laughs> so, it's like so far away, who would ever go there? And so I really only saw that side of the family on big holidays like every other year. But my mom's family was really close. And one of my favorite photos, it actually hangs right uh, near the door when you walk into my, our apartment here, is of the four generations of women in the family. So my sister was sitting with our mother, who is sitting with her mother, who is sitting with her mother. Yeah, so my great-grandmother, who lived with her baby sister of two years <laughs> in their own house until they were both over 100. Yeah, it's tough New England ladies, you know. <laughs> and every other month or so, uh, my mom would drive us down to see Medaget, my great-grandmother, and my Aunt Minnie, my great-great-aunt, in Haverhill, Massachusetts. And my sister and I would rummage through the attic looking for relics of bygone era. Like we found a flag with 48 stars on it. We were like, what? Uh, you know, while the grown ups talked downstairs. And one time, when we were driving home, my mom told us the story of Aunt Minnie's husband, uh, a man who went by the name of Connell but who had been born O'Connell. Minnie got married in a civil ceremony in 1914 because Protestants and Catholics didn't intermarry much at that time. And when Mrs. O'Connell heard the news, she cut off all contact with her son. Minnie's parents were not that happy about the marriage, but they seemed to accept it as the young couple soon moved into their home where they had their first child. 
And one day after the baby was born, Minnie was walking across the bridge from Bradford to Haverhill to do some shopping and was pushing the pram ahead of her when an older woman stopped to admire the child. So, oh, he is so beautiful, she gushed before walking on her way. And Minnie, unable to focus, turned around and went home to cry. The woman, of course, was Mrs. O'Connell, who did not even recognize that she was gushing over her own grandchild. Now, I was probably in my mid-teens when my mom first told me this story, and I've asked her to share it with me several times since then because I find it so remarkable you know, and heartbreaking. My mom, she didn't share that story to pass along family gossip. I guess the kids call it tea today. This wasn't family tea. Right? She did it as a way to talk about intergenerational trauma that prejudice can cause a family and, as a result, our world. And I really remember it so well. Like, riding around in the car with my mom was one of the places I learned what was meaningful in the world. Sitting in that passenger seat was sacred time, you know, even if it just looked like we were running errands together. Now, if you ask my mom, she probably remembers it a little bit differently. I'm sure that it could have been a struggle to get me into the car sometimes. But the memories that I have are really fond ones. When we speak of evolution, typically we default to stories that frame the concept as some sort of idea of physical adaption. Right? We speak of mice that grew big ears so they could hear predators, and, and moths that developed markings that look like eyes, making them seem like predators. But at least in the case of humans, evolution also has an immaterial quality. You know, each of us, right now, is living with tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of years of wisdom that has been passed down to us through an inconceivably long ancestry. Over thousands of generations, we learned and adapted, learned and adapted to become who we are today. You, know, you may not personally know how to start a fire from two sticks, but you know it can be done. That was something we learned, and then we told somebody, and that gift has been passed down from the ancestors. It's really one that we actually just take for granted today. It's like, of course you can start wood from fire. How? But they didn't always know that. But we also learned how to pass down abstract ideas like freedom and love, equality, and prejudice. And when we speak of evolution, it's important for us to consider this dimension because our physiology has changed some, but our minds have transformed. And this wisdom has been passed down in a variety of ways. Books and education, relationships where we mentor and apprentice one another, art, rituals, just like the one we, we just did. Right? And perhaps most famously and most importantly, the oral tradition, storytelling. And some of these wisdom stories are shared intergenerationally uh, in the car while driving to New Hampshire, back from Massachusetts after a visit with the elders. Sometimes it's around the dinner table. Some situations are more formal. You know, when you get right down to it, I am a professional storyteller. Right? The, the quality of the wisdom, sometimes dubious and suspect. <laughs> but I exist within a tradition of shaman who have told the tribal stories of meaning and belonging for generations. So many we don't even know how to count them. And I, I suppose this is why I created the lay ministry program. You know, there was a time when we listened to elders gathered around the fire. 
Why do you like hearing the lay ministers? Like, is it because you learn personal stories about your friends? Or are they outlining a moral vision of what it means to belong in this community? I'm going to go with the, with the latter. More recently, technology, specifically movies, podcasts, and social media, have become part of our storytelling toolbox. And they've introduced us to voices and, and wisdom that was completely inaccessible to most of us as little as a generation ago. Technology is evolving the species, and it's doing so at a rapid pace. And we are experiencing widespread social change, largely due to technological developments, some of which are really good, and some of which need some moderation. And sometimes I tease my sister because of the very first presidential election that she could vote in, uh, she came home, I pulled in the driveway and she was flustered and I was like, what'd you, what'd you, who'd you vote for? And she voted for George Bush, <laughs> the senior. And I was like, what? <laughs> and she's like, it's the only name I really knew. Now, I make that joke, and I say it with a little bit of humility, because that election, I voted for Ross Perot, so it's not like I did, knew what I was doing either, right? Like, that was not any smarter. I only see that in hindsight. It's just, I was always a little bit of a rebel. But for generations, you know, most people voted the way their parents voted. You know, after all, this is, this is, we sat around the table and we learned was right and wrong, we learned about politics, they were our primary source of information. Like, where else would we learn about politics? Just the other day, I saw a political map illustrating who would have been elected if only Gen Z had been allowed to vote. There was not a single red district. Not a single one. Now, liberals, don't feel too sanctimonious, they don't like you either. <laughs> but unlike, you know, when I was their age, these people have the internet and they're sharing wisdom with one another in a way that's no longer dependent on older generations. So when we hear Governor Cox talk about social media laws written to protect our children, Please remember that it is the social media that is helping our children learn that Governor Cox is a liar, <laughs> right? who has sold away their future for political power today. Right? He might have ulterior motives besides protecting them. But technology is also not a panacea for transmitting wisdom either. Right? I'm not referring to the proliferation of misinformation like QAnon, right? Uh, humans have found ways to share misinformation long before the internet. The, the Crusades were nothing but conspiracy theories based on misinformation designed to enrich and empower certain people while sending poor people to slaughter. No, I mean that we are living in a profound state of disconnection across and between the generations, and this is impacting how we learn important social and psychological aspects that are really critical for human evolution. The internet has confronted traditional methods of learning wisdom in ways that are radically changing our culture, some of which are really good and some of which need some moderation. And the fundamental breakdown of the church is lamented right, by certain sectors of society, crying over the loss of traditional values. But I think most of us can see through that. right? We know what that means. Still, it is happening. And I still believe that churches have a role as a source of wisdom if they want to evolve. The morality that was given to us by the stories in the Bible and the sutras and the Quran and other texts is uneven, right? Some of it's really wonderful and transcendent. Uh, you know, I gave the lay ministers the story of Jonah because I, 
I think that's one of the greatest stories ever written. Jonah's wonderful. And some of the stories are terrible and should be ignored, even used as examples of how not to live. Right? It's okay to use some of these stories while rejecting others because we know it's okay to move on from these texts as the authoritative word on how to live a meaningful and moral life. Still, we have to have the conversation about how we do that. This doesn't mean that churches are irrelevant. It's just that they have to evolve. We still need wisdom schools where we learn how to pass along what is meaningful and moral from one generation to another. And it can go both ways, right? The intergenerational transmission of wisdom through the oral tradition, through storytelling, is vital to the social and psychological evolution of the human species. It's vital to helping us meet the needs of the future and guiding human development on a global scale. So as you've come to experience, right? This is one of our intergenerational services. So there's an interactive quality today. And today we're going to be sharing wisdom stories with one another. In the box at the end of the pew, you're going to find rings of paper. And you might think of these as links in a chain because that's what they'll become. On your circle, on your ring, write down a story that was shared with you by an elder in your life. Could be a parent, grandparent, could be someone else in your family, could be a mentor. It even could be someone you met only once, but whose wisdom had such a profound impact on you that they changed the way you understood the world. So take a few minutes. David's going to play some music. Write this wisdom onto your link in the chain, and then find someone you don't know or you don't know that well and share why this wisdom was important to you. And when you're finished, you can come forward and we'll have a little table and you can put the ring in the basket and we'll sort of chain it all up so that you can see it next week. All right. Let's share some wisdom stories with one another. So we could keep going. Why don't we keep going at coffee hour and share wisdom out there? I, I want to make sure that Kim gets to brunch on time. She's got important brunch, brunch stuff. And we can sing number 1012. Also, you can tell I love this hymn, though. It is 1012. Or just 12. When I am frightened.
source of life, God, my darling. As we walk out of this beautiful building, given to us by the ancestors, nurtured by us today, prepared as a gift for those who are going to come in the future. Inspire us with the longing to see the worth and the dignity in all of life. Awaken us to the great interwovenness beyond the lines of denomination, the fences of right and wrong, of me and you, of us and them, where we all just rest in the source of being. And fill us with grace so that we might have courage the courage to evolve, to emerge as a people committed to the transformation of the species, guided by love and wisdom, hope and heartbreak, tenderness and vision. Go in peace. Amen. Bell choir, right? Every Tuesday and sometimes Saturday. <laughs> and then on Sunday. Thank you so much. David. There's a friendly face up in the balcony again. Tristan, we've missed you. Thank you for coming back to us. <laughs> Monica's out here outside helping somebody. Amanda, thank you for putting this all together. This is just a lovely team to work with. Uh, please join us for cupcakes and cider out here. I know, I know. And uh, also coffee. And uh, please join us. We'll have more fun out here. Thanks for coming.